Well, thank you and uh, welcome and welcome back to many of you I know who've been, uh, who've been through these sessions before. Um, the agenda we're looking at today, let me run you through these three sections, and it's in between the sections when we'll have a good opportunity for questions. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about are kind of the fundamentals of coolant and antifreeze. Then we're going to go into the important, what you need to know, uh, you know, the takeaways on coolant and antifreeze. And then our third section is going to be uh, on diesel exhaust fluid and get you, uh, kind of get you up to speed on, on, on DEF and what you need to know about that. All right, so we're going to jump right in with coolant, coolant and antifreeze. Um, and first we're going to talk about the role of coolant, okay, and what we ask it to do. So the first thing we ask antifreeze to do for us is to remove heat, right? Excess heat being generated by an engine. We're moving it from the engine to the radiator so we can uh, disperse it in the air. So heat removal is very important. The second thing we need this to do for us is to avoid freezing and boil over. And you can imagine the, the first engines they made, they said, oh, we got a cooling system, we're going to put water in it. And then somebody let it freeze overnight one time and cracked something. And they says, you know what, we need to make this a little better. Uh, we need to put something in there to keep it from freezing. And then the third thing our coolant is going to do for us is prevent corrosion. Because after they put in some, something in there to keep it from freezing, they found out that the inside of all these water contacted systems would rust or corrode and eventually come apart. So oh, we got to prevent that somehow. So these are the things we're going to ask our antifreeze to do for us. Our corrosion, by the way, comes from both metal attack, like rust, the usual stuff we're thinking of, but also the corrosive uh, effects of deposits and scale that occur on the inside of these systems. And liner pitting. <clears throat> liner pitting is a phenomena unique to diesel engines, um, and we will uh, we'll elaborate on this a little bit more. So it's not a problem with, with, with gasoline engines, but it is with diesel. All right? Okay, so that's the role of, uh, the role of what we want coolant to do for us. Um, and to all of you guys who've been in my classes, any of these classes before where I talk about products, you know, there's a point in the uh, presentation when I pretend to put on a lab coat and talk about the formula. So we, got, we have a formula for you today. Um, the formula for antifreeze, pretty simple stuff. It's about 48% water, 48% glycol, and somewhere around 4% additives. And these three components in our system here kind of map to those three big jobs that the, engine, that the uh, antifreeze is supposed to do. Okay, water's job to remove heat, um, the glycol to keep things from freezing, and the additives to prevent corrosion. So we'll take a look at each one of those three as we go through here. Okay, so the first thing we're going to take a look at, removing heat. Okay, water is great at removing heat compared to lots and lots of liquids. Um, the reason is water does a great job at sucking heat in from any metal surface it's in contact with, okay? It does it faster and better than many liquids do. And then a gallon of water will hold more heat than a gallon of most other liquids as well, all right? So water is ideally suited to be a heat transfer medium. That's why we like it. Um, but another important aspect of it is the quality and people overlook the quality of water, all right? I mean, when I was a kid, my dad said, hey, top off the radiator. You know, we go out there to the garden hose, put it in there, right? This is not a good idea, okay? Water quality uh, uh, water is, is, and cleanliness is important because poor quality water, think hard water and hard water deposits, I mean, those are the same kind of things that will occur inside your engine. And we don't like scale and deposits inside of engines because a coating of scale or deposits, one, stops heat from being transferred out very well, right? It acts like an insulator, which is exactly what you don't want in your cooling system. And two, bits of chunk and scale start to plug passages, like radiator passages, anywhere where it's getting small. So scale is not desirable for that reason as well. So using distilled water or deionized water, this is tip number one for keeping your cooling system happy. Use really, really good water. Okay, now that's water as the first ingredient. Our second 
coolant ingredient is glycol. Um, glycol there to avoid freezing and prevent boil over. It elevates the boiling point and lowers the freezing point, lowers the freezing point considerably. The most common glycol that's used is ethylene glycol, sometimes seen written uh, or abbreviated as EG. Ethylene glycol is very, it's an industrial kind of fluid made in very large plants in very large quantities. As a result, it's widely used and it's very cheap. So it is, it is by far the most common used in, in antifreeze and coolant formulations. Propylene glycol is the other glycol you'll see. So if, if, if you've got an antifreeze product with the suffix PG at the end of it, there's a good chance that it's got propylene glycol as its glycol. And it's, used, it's probably been marketed as being environmentally friendly or safer to use or sometimes green, okay? Propylene glycol is much, much less toxic than ethylene glycol. And that's, that's why it is a popular, that's why it's considered a greener product. But it's also not made in anywhere near the quantities that ethylene glycol is. It's a different process. As a result, it is more expensive. So if you want the propylene glycol, you end up having to pay for it. All right. Propylene glycol, in fact, is uh, of such low toxicity that in, in small quantities, it is sometimes used as a food additive to add body and sweetness to certain foods. Okay, so we covered the water, we covered the glycol. Okay, now let's talk about the additives, all right? The additives um, are in there to prevent corrosion, okay? Corrosion was the third function that we asked our antifreeze to do for us. And there are a bunch of additives that can do that. So um, we're gonna start out uh, we're going to cover each one of these bullet points that I'm coming here in a little bit more detail, but I'll give you the summary now. We've got the silicates. Silicates have been around a long time. They are the basic uh, building block of the old school type antifreezes. Nitrites, these are additives um, uh, specifically needed in diesel engines. There's a, the, what I'm calling the other inorganics. There's about four or five different additives in this category we'll briefly mention because uh, we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on those details. And then there are the organic acids. Um, and you may have heard of organic acid technology, which is abbreviated OAT or OAT as part of a antifreeze formulation. Uh, we'll spend a uh, considerable time with that because that's pretty important stuff. And then the last thing we're going to cover are the dyes that are part of the additives and uh, what additive color means to antifreeze, okay? So we'll go through these one by one on each of these five items. And the first we're going to look at is silicates, the original antifreeze additive. Um, they have been around a long time and they're kind of the basis of the type of antifreeze that's called conventional. Typical, old school, traditional, these silicate additives. And these silicate additives work by being dissolved in your antifreeze, poured in your engine, and once in the engine, they go around and on all the surfaces, all the metal surfaces they contact, radiator, uh, the pump, engine block, they're putting down a coating of silicate, putting down a protective layer, not allowing the water and dissolve oxygen to get to the metal surfaces and begin corroding them. So that's how it works as an anti-rust, anti-corrosive additive, right? It's got this layer going down everywhere. And the problem with these is that they just don't last terribly long, at least in the scope of things. Uh, back real long ago when this was, uh, uh, you, know, you know, go back to the 60s at least, if you got 12,000 miles out of an antifreeze, that was a pretty good that was a pretty good interval. And uh, um, they tried to extend the drain interval on that and, and put in more silicate to get it to last longer. And that starts to run into some problems. And that's because higher concentrations, as you're putting in more of it, okay, higher concentrations eventually causes the stuff to glob together. They begin to form gels. 
And it doesn't help if you have some other contaminants. You might have some scale or some other particles or something else that got into your system, even some dirt. Um, these things help to work with these gels to make even thicker and lumpier blobs of stuff. So you had blobs that would, that would plug radiator tubes. You had blogs that would you know, restrict, even plug passages, uh, heater hoses and things like that. Um, so this, this arms race of trying to up the silicate content in your old school antifreeze was a real problem. And uh, everybody kind of had their formulation on the ragged edge of going overboard just to get as much in there as they could. And uh, everything was all carefully balanced and suddenly you put somebody else's antifreeze into this one and things would go out of balance and more stuff would come out of solution. Um, so life was pretty challenging to some of these cooling systems back under the original high silicate level antifreeze, conventional antifreezes. Um, and as a result of all that, you got stuck with, again, this relatively short service life um, of these products. So that's the story on silicates, other than most, everybody of course now recognizes that you can't win this, this protection war by cranking in silicates to the max. So they've introduced and developed some other chemistries and they now have what are called low silicate formulations. Still work by the same mechanism, but they don't, they're not on the, they're not teetering on the edge of coming out of solution quite yet. Okay. After silicates, we wanted to talk about nitrites, okay? Nitrites are specifically designed for diesel liner pitting problems, okay? If you have some nitrite additives in your antifreeze that's in your car, there's no harm, no foul, okay? So it's a, it's a, you can use, you can use a truck, nitrited truck antifreeze in a car without worried, without worries about the nitrite misbehaving. And the mechanism, uh, why this happens, uh, this pitting, and this pitting, if you've ever seen it, if you imagine a cylindrical liner, you end up with these pits along, it's kind of like in a row, not a, not a straight row, but a whole band of them going up and down the liner um, is where they happen. The reason it happens is because diesel combustion is a bit of a different beast than gasoline combustion, and that the diesel combustion is more violent and that violent causes shaking of that liner. I mean, it's, it's very tiny shaking, right? It's nothing you would see going on. But what happens on the very surface of the liner is as it shakes one way, it creates a very tiny bubble. And then it shakes back the other way, the bubble collapses, and that actually causes an impact on the surface of the liner. I mean, nobody wants to think, nobody can imagine, or it's hard to imagine, little bitty bubbles you know, wearing its way into a chunk of steel, but that's exactly what it happens after millions and millions of these repetitions. So the nitrites interfere with that process, prevent this liner pitting from happening. Unfortunately, nitrites do get consumed over time, okay? They do get used up. So when you buy a conventional antifreeze, conventional type antifreeze for heavy duty trucks. You want to buy one that's pre-charged with this stuff. That's the terminology, a pre-charged heavy duty um, coolant or antifreeze has already has a slug of nitrite already in there to give you some protection. But you also need to keep feeding it nitrites over time. Over some sort of service interval, the nitrites are going to get used up you need to keep putting more in. Do that most commonly one of two ways. One, if you've got a regularly scheduled service interval and you get your, your, your units in every X thousand miles, um, you, you have a one quart additive supplement thing that's mostly nitrites and you put it in there. Okay, those are your, those are your supplementary coolant additives or SCAs come in a liquid form. The other very simple way to do it is to utilize a filter, if you're assuming you've got a filter built into the cooling system in that engine, you get a filter that has a, basically a puck of this additive stuff built into it. 
like the chlorine puck in your pool, right? So as the coolant is going by, it's slowly dissolving off a little bit of nitrite from this stuff and keeps getting used up and used up. And then if you've got a, the, an adequate replacement interval on that filter, you won't run out of nitrite. You're just putting a new one on each time you swap out your filters. Okay? So either liquid supplementary coolant additives at a regular interval or coolant filters with the, uh, with the additive built in. All right, so that's how we take care of keeping diesel engines happy and unpitted with a conventional old school type antifreeze. The third set of additives to talk about here are what I call the other inorganics, um, borates, nitrates, phosphates, molybdates. Um, we won't go into a lot of details on these. These have been added um, early on, developed, for instance, to give better protection for, the, for joints that were soldered in there, or maybe better protection for brass, uh, better protection for aluminum. Okay, so these are, and, and we won't, again, we won't beat these into submission too much. I will point out, just so you know, that nitrates are different from nitrites. Okay, nitrites, the ones we need in conventional for diesel, has spelled with an I here instead of an A. Nitrates, um, in fact, nitrates are, are actually outlawed in Europe, and uh, there's been reduced and reduced use of them in the U.S., so we don't see as much of those anymore. The way to remember which one is important for our liner pitting is that pitting has two I's and two T's, and nitrite has two I's and two T's. Okay? So if, if I was giving a test, you guys would get that one right. All right. The next category, and we'll spend a little bit more time with on additives, is our organic acids our OATS, O-A-T, which is short for Organic Acid Technology, okay? Organic Acid Technology is used in those antifreezes that are also referred to as Extended Life Coolants, or ELCs. So ELCs and OATs are kind of synonymous with each other, all right? It's kind of the high-tech coolant additive. I mean, they've been around for a couple of decades, which in the antifreeze world, it's just the other day, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's, it's definitely different than our conventional product that we've been talking about. And what makes it so different is OATs are dissolved in your water glycol mix, right? And they're floating around the engine. But instead of making a surface coating on every tube and pipe and piece of metal they come in touch with, these guys float around and notice when corrosion is starting somewhere. And wherever corrosion is starting, they go and put a little patch on it. Okay, they react with what's going on in terms of the corrosive mechanism, and they bind it up. All right? So you stopped corrosion in its tracks right there. And maybe it had to do it here, and maybe over here. But in the meantime, the, that, that oat additive is still floating all through the entire system, okay? So it's reacting, it's working only at the site of the corrosion. And as a result, the stuff hardly gets used up. Hardly gets used up anywhere in there, okay? You don't have to replenish it like you do with, with some of the other things we've talked about. In addition, because it doesn't put a coating on all these surfaces, you get better heat transfer, okay? I mean, before our heat had to make it through the metal block, then through the silicate, then into the water glycol mix, right? Well, here you don't have the silicate layer to go through. That's worth 8% cooling. Now, in a well-designed engine, is not running close to that, but, you know, you get pulling a load up a hill under certain conditions, and you might want all the heat transfer you can get. And then organic acids tolerate dilution better, okay? Because these additives and the way they're floating around in there, they get 10%, 20% dilution. They, they hardly know, they're still floating around in there. 
Okay, they still have your, your, your additive still has a good chance of finding that little spot of corrosion that's starting. Again, the key here is it's an entirely different mechanism than your conventional, than your conventional silicated product was. Another advantage, remember we talked about that silicate and that buildup and being a balancing act. On the organic acid side of things, there's nothing there to drop out. Okay? You just got this percentage of stuff that's floating around all the time. So the, the, the possibility of it dropping out in the same way that the silicates do is kind of gone. All right? And as a result of this, again, it's an entirely different technological approach on the additive side. The water is the same, the glycol is the same, but this is the additive difference. But this different approach allows service lives of one to one and a half million miles on the same antifreeze. Okay? This is, that's, that was considerable improvement, right? When you think about, uh, about what it takes. You do have to, you do have to, on most of these, the, most of the majors who are selling this stuff, um, you do have to add in an extender some way around halfway through, I think to probably to up the oat level. I'm not sure what's exact, and I think probably some of the other minor tweak additives that are in there. But, uh, but that's, you know, a quart of something every 750,000 miles, and you still don't have to go through an entire change on the thing, right? So as OEMs learned about this and started running tests with it, uh, they were really happy. Much, much lower maintenance than the conventional stuff, okay? So which OEMs do factory fill? with oats anymore? All of them. You got it on the car, a passenger car side of thing. I mean, GM, GM was the first with Dexcool, and there was a formulation problem and mechanical problem that kind of gave Dexcool a bad name to start with, and people were hesitant, but everybody in the industry is over that now on this side. Heavy-duty trucks, this is all, all OATs on these guys, and then the same thing with off-road. All OAT products, okay? All right? So it's kind of the takeaway that I'll give you on this is there's a conventional, make sure you, you know, the conventional silicate type technology, the old technology, and the OAT new technology. So be aware that those two things are out there. Um, and, and whatever antifreeze you're using or buying or planning to buy or shopping for, understand where it fits in the picture. And speaking of where it fits in the picture, there's something out there called a hybrid oat. Because when these first came out, when the, when the oats first came out, there was plenty of confusion and there were plenty of people taking their conventional stuff and topping it off on top of their oat product or vice versa, because they just didn't know better or hadn't been trained and didn't know, and, and uh, there, were a there were a number of problems that came from that. So what was developed were hybrids, hybrid oats. That's what that H is, so if you hear about oats. So part of the formulation is an oat, right, this organic acid going around in there, but it also has silicate, low-level silicate. Okay. And if it's heavy duty for trucks, it'll have nitrite in it, right? Um, and that's one of the things about the hybrids. The hybrids still have to have nitrite. You still have to feed nitrite regularly if you have a heavy duty, a heavy duty truck. But it does allow you to top off with either oat or conventional and not worry about bad effects or dilution effects because it's part one, part the other, okay? You get a longer life than a conventional, but you're not anywhere near the life of you get with a full oat. That's the, uh, that's the, general, the general rule, okay? At the time that these came out and that confusion came out in the market, again, this was... 10 years ago plus, um, there were a number of these hybrids out there. Since then, since, since oats are now all in factory fill, 
and they're well placed in the aftermarket, the demand for hybrids has gone down. You don't see as many hybrids out there as, as you used to, at least as a proportion of the business. Uh, one commercial example, though, that you may see is a, um, uh, that's a, of a larger supplier. Uh, Cummins has one of their products. Um, Ernie's familiar with this. He got a call from it earlier this week. Uh, the Cummins uh, F uh, Fleet Guard Complete ES is a hybrid product. Okay, and then the fifth item we're going to talk about in terms of additives is additive dye. Okay? Now, water and glycol and our little percentage of additive pack are all colorless. Okay? So all antifreezes could look alike and be hard to tell them apart. What's unfortunate in the antifreeze business is that there's not true standardization. There are no requirements. There's no ASTM standard that if you have a conventional antifreeze for cars, it's got to be this color. And if you have an oat for heavy-duty trucks that has nitrite in it, it's got to be this color. All right, that does not exist. There's a few people who, if like the market leader started making, um, and a good example is Caterpillar came out with Cat's extended life coolant, and they dyed it red. So most people making an extended life coolant said, well, if I'm going to sell it to people with Caterpillar stuff, it better be dyed what? Red. So you get some of that kind of stuff, that follow leader stuff going on in the industry. But again, there's no true standardization, and you can make it any color you want. Um, so here's an example of, uh, of some of the most common colors. And I will tell you there are a number of exceptions. Um, green would be a conventional antifreeze for automotive use, okay? Um, fuchsia is probably a conventional antifreeze, but it's pre-charged with those nitrite additives for heavy-duty use. You know, here's our red, which is a heavy-duty, an oat for uh, ELC for diesel engines, but it may have nitrite, it may not. And there's some, ye some yellows that were oats for diesels that were specified without nitrite. So this can be very, very confusing. Like I said, there's a lot, this is, this is a good area to beware and do not buy antifreeze by color. S sell me your green stuff. That's kind of a dubious path to go down. Okay? I mean, in fact, ours, our, uh, we sell a green stuff that is, um, treat that is actually the same as this kind of product. Okay? It's treated with SCAs, nitrites, for heavy-duty diesel, but is dyed green. All right, so that's the, uh, that's the story of color. Again, is a, is a uh, be aware, you need to know more than the color about your antifreeze. All right, I want to briefly discuss additive level. And by additive level, I mean whether you have too much additive or too little additive. I've already harped on this a little bit uh, in talking about, and this was a, especially when this was a real problem with the really, really old conventional silicated, high silicate problems uh, that came up. Um, but if your additive level is too low, you're going to get poor corrosion coverage. Okay? That's, that's, the, that's what's going to happen there. And that's true if you look, because when you, when you look at the antifreeze in your engine and it tells you that the glycol is about 25% instead of 50%. It also means you have about half the amount of additive in there that you need for corrosion protection. Okay, so if your level is too high, you start running these risks of gels and dropout. Okay? So, and, and that can come about, if you can imagine, the, uh, you've got a, a system and for some reason the water gets boiled off regularly and you're topping, you just keep topping off with 50-50 even though your water gets boiled off, okay? So when you're putting in that 50-50, you're putting in more glycol, but what's leaving is just water. You put in glycol and water and the water leaves, you put in glycol and water and the water leaves, pretty soon you've got way too much glycol and way too much additive because the additive is coming in with the glycol and it's not getting boiled off, just the water was getting boiled off. All right, but
Folks, this is our first breaking point for some questions that might be bubbling out there. Um, does anybody have any so far? There are, yeah, okay, the question is, um, let me see if I can repeat the question, is are hybrid coolants the type that are marketed for, can top off any type of antifreeze, any type of system? And the answer is in most cases, yes. In most cases, yes. But any more because, so, because OEMs now for years have only been putting OATs in their cars. Any, someone could put out an OAT saying, hey, this is good for any make, any model. Because they're discounting, they're saying, you know what, those old cars that are still using the old conventional are, are so old, we're not even going to worry about them. So, uh, so again, you, you want to be sure you're at least buying it from a, from a reputable, very reputable supplier. All right, let me see if I can make sure that everybody heard, I don't know if everybody heard the question. It's, it's a great question. Is if you got an old system, and make sure I understand the question, if you got an old system and you know you got some corrosion in there, can you switch over and run OAT in that system, and then that OAT would go and help with that corrosion, right? Um, and I'm, I'm, I, I actually address something similar to this in the next section, but I'm going to go ahead and answer this now. One of the problems with that is if you've got that much corrosion and stuff going on, you may have a number of places where the corrosion byproducts and additive fallouts from your previous stuff are all what's holding things together. And one of the things about these OATs is they act very, very good as cleaning agents and cleaning up that stuff. Okay? So now you've got the possibility that if your old corrosion products was acting as a stop leak <laughs> in there, that putting in the new stuff would clean that away. So that's, that's, a, that's a known risk. All right, does that answer the question? Or at least not risk. Yeah, are nitrates as important in lighter duty diesel trucks um, as they are in older? I, I'm going to offer my opinion and observation that they are as important. Yeah. If in a conventional antifreeze. Now that, that said, almost all of the power stroke and all those models, they're all coming with the organic acid technology in them. Okay. And in OATs, you don't necessarily need nitrites. You will find OATs with nitrites added to them as an insurance package, but OATs don't need nitrites. So, that, so there are nitrite-free OATs out there that do just fine at preventing the uh, piston liner damage from in diesel engines. OK? All right. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yep, do you guys hear that? If you've got a fleet of stuff with uh, tractors and vehicles from the 50s all the way forward, running conventionals, maybe got hybrids in them now, and if you switch over to ELC, are things going to suddenly go to hell? Yeah. Right? That's the nutshell of the question. Um, and I do address this in the next section a little bit. Um, the, the best answer is proceed with caution. Not saying it can't be done. I would never haul them all in one day, dump them in, and go. Um, well, if a couple of things, but if, if the hybrid, if they're working now on a hybrid and it's doing okay, and you really only want to go with one antifreeze, okay? Because again, if you, can, if you can segregate to two and have your more recent stuff and your clean stuff on a full OAT, then you don't have to mess with it as far as a service interval, you know, for a real long time, right? Um, 